It is the imperial ecologist Pardo Kynes, the father of Liet, who sets about attempting to transform the ecology of Arrakis on a planetary scale. This occurs long before the arrival of the Atreides on Arrakis, and makes up the first appendix in Dune, entitled The Ecology of Dune. Pardo, like his son Liet, is very much the western man amongst the Fremen, and he sees the ecological problems of Arrakis from the viewpoint that it is merely an expression of energy, a machine being driven by its sun. In viewing the problem of Arrakis, Pardo Kynes is immediately drawn to the Fremen population. This is not through any form of cultural admiration or sense of debt to the people of this world, being their imperial planetologist, but rather for the reason that he sees them as the tools with which he can shape the ecological future of Arrakis. With that in mind, Pardo quickly analyses the need to make the Fremen his ecological and geological tools for change, his geomorphic agents. In understanding this, he determines he needs to avoid any restrictions placed upon him and the population by the Harkonnen, followed by the need to ingratiate himself into the Fremen. To do this, he determines that he needs to marry a Fremen woman and produce a son, with whom he can begin an ecological education that can spread throughout the Fremen sieges. Pardo Kynes ingratiates himself to a degree with the Fremen by assisting some Fremen youths who are outnumbered and being attacked by Harkonnen soldiers. Kynes neither realises the fighting ability of these youths or his peril with the Fremen themselves, but the young Fremen bring him to their siege out of a degree of gratitude. Herbert describes Pardo at this juncture as not being naive, but rather a man who permits himself no distractions from his task, and instead identifies the enormous single-mindedness the innocence with which he approached any problem. When Pardo arrives with the Fremen he begins telling them of his plans for Arrakis, oblivious to the debate which is going on around him. At this point Pardo Kynes is viewed with suspicion by the Fremen, who distrust all those not of Arrakis, and although they are aware he is an agent of the Emperor as Imperial Planetologist, they are unsure of this madman who also kills Harkonnen. However, Pardo has seen both the sacred Chris knives of the Fremen and one of their sieges, secrets that the people of the desert keep unto death. The decision to kill Kynes and take his water is soon made out of brutal necessity, and an experienced fighter is sent to kill him, along with two men to reclaim his water. Once again Herbert is showing us the harshness of life and the necessity of the severity of the Fremen ways. Simultaneously, he is illustrating that the Fremen act for the good of the collective, rather than out of any personal needs or desires. What follows is intriguing from Herbert's point of view of the dangers of a hero to society, as Kynes becomes an ecological hero to the Fremen. It's doubtful that Kynes even focused on his would-be executioner. He was talking to a group that spread around him at a cautious distance. He walked as he talked, a short circle, gesturing. Open water, Kynes said. Walk in the open without still suits. Water for dipping it out of a pond. Portigals! The knife man confronted him. Remove yourself, Kynes said, and went on talking about secret wind traps. He brushed past the man. Kynes's back stood open for the ceremonial blow. What went on in that would-be executioner's mind cannot be known now. Did he finally listen to Kynes and believe? Who knows? But what he did is a matter of record. Uliet was his name. Older Liet. Uliet walked three paces and deliberately fell on his own knife, thus removing himself. Suicide? Some say Shai Hulud moved him. Talk about omens! From that instant, Kynes had but to point, saying, Go there. Entire Fremen tribes went. Men died. Women died. Children died. But they went. From this point on, Pardo Kynes has fanatical loyalty from the Fremen who view Uliet's suicide as a mystical sign from Shai Hulud. 
the Fremen give Uliot a holy status in the afterlife, making him an Uma. Ironically, it is his own words to Liet, no more terrible disaster could befall your people than for them to fall into the hands of a hero, that show how blind Pardo was to the Fremen's attitude to him, his western man focus being centred entirely on the problem of solving the ecological needs of Arrakis. Pardo is seen as a sadist, and the Fremen view him as someone who was not a madman totally, just mad enough to be holy. Once again begins the process of transforming the environment of Arrakis by the efforts of human beings. The previous transformation of the ecosystem of Arrakis was accidental and had many unusual consequences, but this time it will be quite deliberate. Pardo Kynes' means for doing so will be the Fremen, his geomorphic tools for change. This change will take, according to Kynes' estimates, three to five hundred years. In the timeline of the Dune series, two generations will have passed before the arrival of Paul Atreides and the ecological transformation of Arrakis has begun, undertaken by the Fremen, in the hope of one day realising their dream of turning their adopted world into a paradise. This process of change is managed by Pardot's son Liet, named in honour of Uliet. It is through the Firefreloik's feudal system that allows Liet to take over as Imperial Planetologist to Arrakis and to continue installing Fremen in key positions within the remnants of the Imperial Desert Botanic Testing Stations. These testing stations have existed on Arrakis prior to the discovery of the Spice Melange and have seemingly all but been abandoned once spice production began to flourish. Just after his arrival on Arrakis, Paul Atreides recalls viewing a film book about the planet's use by the Emperor as a testing station, which was used to study a number of species of desert flora and fauna that have been transplanted at some point to the desert world, and have ceased to exist elsewhere in the Imperium. Arrakis, His Imperial Majesty's Desert Botanical Testing Station. It was an old film book from before discovery of the spice. Names flitted through Paul's mind, each with its picture imprinted by the book's mnemonic pulse. Saguaro, Burrow Bush, Date Palm, Sand Verbena, Evening Primrose, Barrel Cactus, Incense Bush, Smoke Tree, Creosote Bush, Kit Fox, Desert Hawk, Kangaroo Mouse. Names and pictures. Names and pictures from man's tyrannic past, and many to be found now nowhere else in the universe, except here. On Arrakis. Here we see the introduction of a number of species of flora and fauna specifically adapted to survive in the harsh desert environment. It is interesting to note that virtually none of the species indigenous to Arrakis are mentioned, all having been transplanted. These species are however introduced after the arrival of the sandworms, which we can assume have destroyed many of the indigenous life forms. The Atreides look into the possibility of discovering these stations, and it is interesting to note that the period before spice production begins is referred to as the Desert Botanical Testing Station period. Gurney Halleck's investigation into these stations reveals that there were once some 200 or more of these bases, all of which were apparently sealed and abandoned, possibly with their equipment intact. However, his questioning of local Fremen as to the location often garners but a single response. Liet knows. With Pardo Kynes and later his son Liet, the Fremen begin to infiltrate and reopen the testing stations, gathering the equipment that they needed to begin the process of the transformation of Arrakis, and creating the necessary conditions and tools to begin water collection on a massive scale underground. Kynes returned to his imperial chores, directing the biological testing stations, and now Fremen began to appear among the station personnel. The Fremen looked at each other. They were infiltrating the system, a possibility they'd never considered. Station tools began finding their way into the siege warrens, especially cutter rays, which were used to dig underground catch basins and hidden wind traps. Water began collecting in the basins. 
Pardo and Leit represent the Western man's attitudes to the treatment of ecology and environmental alteration. They analyse the problem and create a systemic approach to changing the ecology of Arrakis, with notably no person ever objecting to this in any way. Their attitude towards the Fremen is one of infiltration and manipulation, to the extent that Pardo, more than Leit, view the Fremen as the tools that they can use to achieve their goals. Herbert is again highlighting the infringements of Western societies and their ideologies on indigenous peoples, which often have disastrous consequences. For the Fremen, this will be their relegation to a museum people, and eventually the destruction of their way of life, and ultimately their planet. The appendix, The Ecology of Dune, reads like a mini-adventure in ecology, telling the story of Pardot Kynes and the beginnings of the ecological transformation of Arrakis. It is this section of Dune that reads more like an ecological primer than any other part of the book. Kynes' interactions with the Fremen again give us an idea as to the nature of these tribal people and how they adapt and interact with the harsh desert environment. In contrast to this, Herbert has then begun to follow Kynes' plans to terraform Arrakis, and the two viewpoints present a good contrast between a tribal desert people and a western modern man with his systems and methodologies. It is these Western ideals that bring the Fremen's dream to fruition all too easily, and within a few thousand years, their world and their way of life will be destroyed. <laughs>